Hi, I'm Melissa Smith. I'm Spencer Ziegler, and welcome to Data Lit, a podcast by educators for educators. And we're kicking off season five today with a very special guest. We are, we are honored. We are thrilled, elated. I'm, I'm running out of adjectives to describe we're it. All the things. Yeah, all, all the, the things. things for uh, <laughs> Melissa. Tell, tell, tell our listeners who do we have today. We have Dr. Robert P. Taylor with us, the ooh, superintendent ooh. of Wake County Public Schools. Yeah, Dr. Taylor, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure to be here and, and share and be a part of the podcast. We should say it's an award-winning podcast, <laughs> award right? Award-winning yeah. yes. podcast. Award-winning. Let's make sure yep, we yep, get yep, that yep. in. Let's get that in. Yeah. All right. So, Dr. Taylor, let's start off with some questions to help all of our listeners get to know you a little better. So how long have you been serving in this new role? Can we still say you're new to the job? Are you still saying that? I, I think you can say I'm still relatively new. So, relatively. It, so it hasn't been a year. I started uh, one October. Oh. Uh, and so it's about right at 10 months. And so okay. I'm approaching uh, the one year mark, but it's been an absolutely wonderful year so far. Okay. One year. What is anniversary one year? Is that paper? Which one is that? I think so. Okay. Like in a wedding anniversary? Yeah. Well, We'll it's send them a sticker that'll be our, our paper anniversary. Yeah, first one here. We'll do that. Yeah. I love it. All right. So I understand that you've been serving in public schools for about over 30 years. So can yes. you tell us about yourself briefly, like your educational journey to here? So I think it's a really interesting educational journey. I tell people that I never had the intent to be a teacher. I was uh, working oh. at an elementary school as a teacher assistant while I was in graduate school, working to pay the bills. Right. And I was really inspired by a student, and that made me know that I had to be an educator. Okay. Uh, and so I moved to North Carolina in 1992, and I essentially started out as a substitute and, and went back into uh, the teacher education uh, licensure program. I was a lateral entry teacher, mm. uh, and I've done nearly every position that you can do from teacher assistant to teacher, assistant principal, principal, director, assistant superintendent, uh, superintendent, uh, associate state superintendent, state superintendent in Mississippi, and then now back here in Wake County. So it's been a, a really great journey, but I tell people that I've enjoyed every step of the way, mm. uh, but nothing compares to being a classroom teacher. That's why I yeah. think I found the most joy. Yeah. Yeah. We would agree with you. We miss it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I really do. And that kind of talks about that, that you know, difference between a career and a calling, you yes. know, that gravitational pull, the education in the classroom, you know, pulls people into. Most you know, definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, our, our podcast, you know, we talk a lot about data literacy. And one of the questions we'd like to ask some of our guests is, um, so what does data literacy mean to you? And we're, we're curious to hear your, your response to that. And so to me, it's really a simple uh, definition. It means that you understand data in a way that helps you uh, to make the appropriate change. And so mm. we always hear the conversation of the word that people are data rich, but uh, information poor. poor yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so it is about knowing what does the ta- data tell you about what kinds of changes do I need to make? That's so very important. Uh, the information is always there, but if you're not literate when it comes in your data, then you can make decisions that are, are completely opposite to what the data is telling you. Oh, I love that. That makes me, there's a quote I think we've referenced before from uh, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry. Um, I'll drop the article in the show notes that uh, when we collect data without using it, it's like picking apples off the tree only to let them rot. <laughs> yeah. That makes me yes. think of that. You know, that's, yes. I like that it's about the use, not just collecting, not just admiring. You got to actually use it to improve outcomes. And one of the things I noted in his definition that's been different from what we've heard from our other listeners is that he talked about that to make changes. So in the definition that he's given us, there is already that a verb to move, a call to move, an action call to move, because you just said made changes. So Absolutely. the change could be do nothing, but at least it has that action oriented yeah. uh, phrase. Yes. And that's usually different. We don't usually have people think about data literacy in that way. Yeah, I think that's key to kind of overcome any of our biases and those kind of things to be data informed for the decisions we do or do not make. Yeah. So in a district this size, I can imagine that there's a lot of data to monitor. I'm imagining that in your office, you probably look, look like the Star Trek Enterprise. They're like all of these boards with numbers and, ooh, you know, maybe noises and stuff going on. Uh, what is some of the data that you interact with? Well, I'll first have to ask, is it, uh, 
Enterprise, Enterprise A, B, C, Oh, no, D, see, oh, my God, he got me, he got me. Okay, I'm out, I'm out. So I wasn't ready for that, so I have a tricky, but, uh, uh, And so I think that is a great question because as a, as a school district, and I would say whether you're large or small, we all have the same kind of data. Uh, and so you're really talking about looking at data that affects a much larger landscape, more students, more schools, but the right, data is right, essentially the right. same. Uh, and so obviously we look at student uh, data in terms of all the kinds of testing data, academic data that we have on them. Uh, I also look at financial data and then facilities data. Mm. And so when I think about the student data, this is the most important part. And the first thing that I tell people is that we have EOG and EOC data, end of grade, end of, end of test type data. Uh, we know that's what we call the autopsy. Right. Uh, it is a performance that students have had, uh, and it lets us know what the performance like w- was like for that year. But it also tells us information about uh, what the future could look like, uh, what kind of services students need. Uh, so we do know that that end of grade, end of course data is very important to how we move forward. Uh, more particularly, we want to look at any kind of formative data that we have during the school year. So whether that's uh, M-class data, uh, whether that's NC check-ins, whether it's teacher formative data, attendance data, uh, that kind of tells us uh, along the path how well our students are doing. And, and as I said before, informs the kind of changes that we need to make. One of the things that that I always find interesting when it comes to student data, meaning their grades, Mm -hmm. uh, it can inform us a lot about individual students and teachers as well. So take, for example, uh, I'm a student that doesn't perform well in the classroom. I have Mm -hmm. poor grades, just not there. Uh, But I take the end of grade and the course test and I'm in the 99th percentile. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. We can all, I'm sure we can all think of a student like that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so what does that tell us? Is it that the student is not engaged? Uh, is it that the teacher is not rigorous enough? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then on the opposite side, kid has all A's, uh, and they score very low on in the grade of in the course test. And so that's, does that mean rigor is a question? Are we being too generous with students? So Yeah. That, that validity of grades, is it actually measuring their understanding of the, the key standards or is it pulling in behaviors and some of those other things there? I think that's key, yeah. Absolutely. And, and so we know that uh, teachers should be the best measuring rods for their students and, and uh, any kind of end of course, end of grade testing that we get. Uh, we want that to confirm or reaffirm what we should already right, know. Yeah. And so we, yeah. we understand that kids – can do well academically, but can be poor test takers. We do try to account for that. Yeah. I, I would say the second bucket of data that I look at is financial data. Uh, and so that means that uh, we have a $3 billion budget. And so wow. we have to know and understand how all of those resources are spent, where are we going to put those efforts, uh, where are we duplicating services. And so that's a lot of what I'm trying to do now mm-hmm. is to determine uh, where we can end duplication Uh, and put resources in places where they're sorely needed. Uh, When we think about student population and student growth, uh, where are we going to put classrooms? Where are we going to put buildings? And so that's Mm -hmm. all a part of that financial data that we have to be aware of. Compensation is big, uh, and we want to compensate people accordingly and correctly, uh, but you got to have the resources to do that, and so it's about being efficient. And I think the last piece of the big data chunks that I look at would be our facilities data. And so you know that uh, we, we get a lot of conversation, I would say, about our HVAC systems. Yep. And our ch- <laughs> struck a responsive chord. Right? Um, but the data can inform us on how we can get better. Uh, we have over 500 pieces of equipment, uh, and we collect a tremendous amount of data on that equipment, how old it is, how often it breaks down, when was it installed, uh, are we spending too much money on a repair and it's time to get something new. Right. Uh, And so knowing and understanding what that data means uh, really gives us a good, clear picture of how we can get better in that particular area. Yeah. That makes me think of, you know, we did the series last year on um, categorizing data into satellite, that kind of like mile high, which you talked about there, that map level, which might be more like interim, and then that street data, which it's, you know, proximity to the learner, the end right. user. Um, and hearing you bounce between, you know, starting with the satellite, but always going down to that street level about yeah. that formative data. So it's not a surprise or, you know, giant budget, but then going down to that 
HVAC level. And that I think that zooming in and out, and that's probably speaks to you starting in the classroom. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Wild to think when you're there that you'd have a budget this size. Uh, you, know? you would never think it. I mean, it, it was just a small budget from selling pizza and buying T-shirts for kids. And now three billion dollars. There that's you go. Lot. There you go. So, yeah, you are working with a tremendous amount of data. What's something about the data that you work with that our listeners might find interesting, surprising? So that was a question that I anticipated. And, and one of the things I always find interesting is uh, what people know about our market share in terms mm-hmm. in terms of student attendance. And so our market share now is about 75% of the students in Wake County. That means that that 160,000 students that we represent are served. That's uh, 75 to 77 percent of all students in Wake County. So that means that you have students that are homeschooled, yeah. uh, students that are in charter schools, and students that are in private schools. And so we have to monitor that data very closely. And some of the things that people don't know is that there is a portion of public school dollars that have to go yep. uh, to charter schools and, and now even to private schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we have to make sure that Uh, We know what that data looks like, what our market share is like, where students are going to be populated and where we're going to build schools and and, and all of those things that are associated with the size of a district and and all of the logistics associated with it. So market share to me uh, is something that people need to, to really know and understand. That data also shows that the money that's sent to those schools, many people believe that is not public school dollars. So take, Mm. for example, yeah, yeah, when we think about uh, the opportunity scholarship, that is a part of the market share. uh, And people believe it is a scholarship. But it is dollars that could be spent on public schools that's now directed in a different place. Uh, So I always find that data interesting and, and hope that people look into that. I think the other piece of the data is the number of people that come to Wake County on a daily basis and on a yearly basis. Yeah. And yeah. Depending on who you ask, that number can be anywhere from 51 to 57 people a day. And, and so that means that we have to know, plan, and be ready for those uh, families that come in that bring children. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so the data informs us about uh, where we will play schools and, and, and students. I've always said it. I've never worked in a district that builds this many schools in I, I my know, life. I know. I yeah. know. Yeah. You know, when when you when you make mention of that, I think it speaks volumes about uh, how very important it is to be able to look out beyond two or three years. Because, mm. yeah, you know, uh, I remember it was maybe uh, twelve or thirteen years ago maybe a little shorter, that Wake County surpassed uh, Charlotte Mech as the largest yeah. district. In, yeah. And they were always telling as, as as the big fish in the ocean. Right. Uh, and now we uh, surpassed them by almost 20,000 students. And, and so you're talking about a district that has gone from 120, 130 schools to now over 200 in a relatively short amount of time. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be slowing down at any point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. While our department is known for supporting staff with their data literacy skills, we also conduct educational research as well. And I understand that you are one of five co-authors. I found some information about you. (laughs) (laughs) He's the co-author of an an article called College Social Experiences Between First Generation Students and Other Students in STEM Programs at an HBCU. Absolutely. Um, And I thought it was really interesting. (laughs) Uh, So what are some ways in which uh, educational research has guided your practice over the years? And, and, And so I think this is a really great question because... Educational research is really about informing the work that we do. It is work that should help us as practitioners. What are we going to do different in the classroom based on that research? I also remind people that educational research, I don't want to call it in a pure sense, but what's done at the university level, it doesn't give us the the, the depth that we need. Uh, normally, you have a, a professor or a researcher that gather some data. Mm -hmm. Uh, They send that through some statistic in SPSS, and they will come out and talk about what is statistically significant and what happened to this group versus that group. Uh, And so it does give us information about uh, programs that we have in school. But one of the things that I want to continue to push is that we as educators 
uh, be at the forefront of educational research. And so imagine uh, the 10 or 12,000 teachers that we have every day that are teaching, they have data, they're implementing strategies, they're working with programs, and they are, in my opinion, in a unique position to be able to do that practical research oh, yeah. and share that yeah. with other teachers. And I, and I absolutely believe that's where we make a, a, a difference. And so so I, I, I call myself a, a practical and pure researcher. You have to blend mm-hmm. those two together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I'm always excited about it. And, and, and I just know that we are in that unique position as educators to really inform the work that we do. I always make the argument that uh, doctors and lawyers – they make decisions about their professions, uh, but it's someone else that's doing it for us. And so when we yeah. talk about conducting the research, publishing that, and, and showing what's working and what's not working, I think that speaks volumes to everybody else. I love how you speak about our size. Sometimes I think we speak about our size in Wake County apologetically as yeah. it's a hindrance, but I love how you speak of it as it is. it can be a tremendous value. There's so many researchers here at our disposal, you know? And actually, you inspire us. You, you spoke at our staff meeting last spring. Maybe five months ago, yeah, six yeah, months yeah. ago, yeah. And yeah. you mentioned something along the lines, and that, that did inspire us. So this season, what we're going to do is we're going to interview some of those Wake County teachers and educators that have conducted research. And so throughout the season, they're going to chat about what research they conducted and um, how it inspired them and how it's changed their practice. So that'll be coming in the feed throughout this year. He also made me think about, I wonder if there's a way that we can organize, because until now, I didn't see myself as an educational researcher, mm. but I love how we did, described it, where every teacher is an educational researcher. We have yeah. to think, well, I have to be in a doctorate program or and do an, an MSA or something to be an educational researcher. But we are practical folks. We are, as like you said, we're gathering data, we're trying things, we're testing it out. So when we think about what works, the teachers would know what works. So Absolutely. how can we... Absolutely. Uh, gather that information, organize it. It, it, it. My wheels are spinning. Something else will be coming. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking down those lines, I like that. The practical and pure researcher, because too much there's this kind of false dichotomy of like, yeah. research means you have to be in this program. You have to do this yeah, like yeah. 37. You need to know the 2000 rules behind an APA 12 <laughs> or something like that. And yeah. just making it a little bit easier for people to conduct and share research. Yeah. And the sharing of part, right? Because yeah. that's one of the things, if you remember when we were in the classroom, that we had... Uh, some challenges with, like being able to share what works and what isn't working yeah. with your PLC. But how can we move beyond just my PLC with other schools, schools that are like me, and get like, you know, like gather all that information so that, again, we can do what's good for kids. Yeah, yeah I think those are the key things that uh, we have information on uh, school types that right. are alike, classroom types that are yeah. alike. And so that means that when we look at the student populations and know where well, there are similar populations, if a teacher is doing research on what this particular standard or, or, or mm-hmm. curricular activity does and the outcome, now I can say I have similar students. Mm-hmm. She's published some portion of her research, and now I can begin to, to do this same kind of thing to see if it works in my class as well. Right, so what right. we know is that our solutions to problems are going to be similar. So that means if, if you use baking soda to put out a fire, you know, that might work for a fire for me. I know not to use gasoline, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I see that as an opportunity to uh, have teachers share about what they are doing uh, and then others not only in this district but anywhere where there's access to information, they can see what we're doing and then be able to make the subtle adjustments to the students in the classrooms where they are. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so, and if anybody's listening and has some ideas, contact us. Be it sharing on the podcast, but also, you know, where the Data Research and Accountability Department, these conversations we've been having. So, yeah, let's think about how to make the practitioners uh, better empower them to share what they've learned. Yeah. And and so I'll I'll, I'll leave you with one last challenge. Uh, Have you all come up with a name? I, I have one in mind. Ooh, ooh, give me, give me, give me, give me. We we haven't, so yeah, thank you. (laughs) The Wake County Journal of Educational Research. How about that? All right, all right. Yeah. Working title, working title. Yep, Yep, I like that. I like that. I like like that. That's good. good. Yeah, that's that's a great spot to to land the plane. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for sharing your expertise with our listeners. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been a joy to be able to share, and I just want you guys to know how much I appreciate Thank you. Uh, the data work that you do and how very important that is. A uh, great, uh, large part of what we do in this district and, and very important to me. Well, thank, thank you. you.
Yeah, and also thank you to uh, Ligon Middle School's Alex Scott for Dreamscapes, which is our new theme song for uh, for the season. Sounds great. Yep. Yeah. For more about this podcast, you can head to www.wcpss.net slash data lit. And if you want to contact us, we now have an email address where, you know, it took us five seasons. But now we're, <laughs> we're legit. Uh, data lit at wcpss.net. And we'll catch you next time. Bye.